today we are going to talk about um, setting your clients up for success in this absolutely nuts market. Um, there's the possibility that things are going to calm a little bit, but I don't think we foresee any major changes anytime soon. So um, it's really it's it's really good to have some tools in your belt to have some idea of how to approach this. Even when you're new, these things could get you really far, if not with an accepted offer with your clients. And that's really the important thing. So um, we're going to talk around um, showings. So leading up to showings and um, during showings and following showings. And then on Thursday, um, Janine's going to talk about writing winning offers in this crazy market. So you'll have between the two classes, you should have a really good set of information to help you um, best help your buyer clients. And um, these are some things too, to keep in mind from the selling perspective. Um, so we, I, we were talking briefly about um, listings I had, Alex mentioned the videos I had put on social media this week, um, this past week. And I was back in a listing agent's shoes for the first time in a little while, a um, month or so, and getting the perspective of what's going on behind the scenes on that side is also just a good refresher on all of the things that you can do as a buyer's agent um, to best represent your client and help them to be successful. So has anybody recently been out on showings or written offers? Oh, yeah. 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 Has anybody gotten an accepted offer? Lost out on a few the past week. Okay. It's pretty brutal out there, you guys. It's it's not just new people that are missing out. It's what buyers are willing to do right now is pretty nuts. Um and might not be the best thing for them besides, but we'll we'll talk about that later. So when it comes to you've got a new buyer client you've done your buyer consultation, you've done your due diligence to find out what's important to them, to set them up for success with what's happening in the market. So you're setting those expectations. You are um, talking about what to expect from the market. You know, things like if you see a house pop up on MLS or wherever that you want to see, let me know. And I will do the same because as soon as it hits the market, we need to go see it within one or two days. And if it's Monday and that house doesn't have an accepted offer yet and it went on the market before the weekend, they are probably reviewing offers now. I can always find out, but I want to set your expectations that if it's been on the market more than a few days, there's a good chance that they have offers already, just to keep in mind. The other thing you want to set them up for success with is be ready to write an offer. So the day we see this house, if you love it, be ready to write an offer that day. I, as your agent, am going to put a little buffer of time after our showing so that, or depending on, um, you know, what, what they're saying is their offer review time. I'm going to find out everything I can. I'm going to look on MLS for those notes. I'm going to reach out to the agent directly to find out if they have offers in hand and if they have a planned offer review time. And I'm going to add a little buffer after our showing based on that information and when you're available so that if you love it, we can write an offer right away. And it's not a scramble and it's not an, oh shoot, I'm not available to write this offer before it's due. Um, I'm being proactive, but I'm also telling you buyer, be ready. If you see a house you really love, we need to be ready to write an offer that day. Um, you know, writing an offer will take about, you know, for me, it takes about an hour to walk through an offer from the time we start to the time I send it to the agent, about an hour and a half. It might take you longer if you're new. So plan accordingly um, and, and let your buyers know too. You definitely don't want them to go look at a house, love it, say they want to write an offer and then they have to get back to work and you can't even talk to them until the end of the day. It might be too late. So making sure that they are prepared for this sort of speed and intensity from the get-go. Set those expectations because if you don't, what will happen is you will send them homes, you will try to get them in, they'll tell you last minute when they wanna see houses, they'll not understand when we can't get in, right? You wanna make sure they're aware that when we're scheduling these showings, most cases there's no overlaps. They're only a half hour a long, half hour sometimes long. 15 minutes. So. We want to make sure that 
you know, as soon as you are interested, you tell me so I can block a time before they get all scooped up. Um, but if those things happen and they haven't had their expectations set, then it looks like you're not doing your job. Then when they have a complaint about how things are going, it'll look like you have excuses. So be proactive and tell them from the get-go in their buyer consultation. And if it's been a while since that consultation, the market's probably changed. So take the time while you're on showings or, or have a check-in call or Zoom or something to say, just so you know, here's what we're noticing. And even though there's a little more inventory coming out, this is still the speed of the market. This is what people are doing to get offers accepted. It is very, very competitive. People are willing to strip out their inspection, their appraisal contingency. They're going forty, fifty thousand dollars over asking price, depending on what location you're in. Um, being able to explain that the the what is happening with pricing, you know, people paying over asking is not necessarily paying over market value. In many cases, homes are being priced below market value. This is a good note for your sellers too. If you have noticed, these homes are selling and they are appraising for the most part. And the reason for that is people are strategically pricing homes under market value. So these, I wrote over asking 15,000 and I didn't get it, is not necessarily what the actual market value is. In many cases, hold the comps. In many cases, 20, 30, $40,000 more than what they're asking is the actual market value. So be aware of that, set their expectations for that. Because if you don't, you're writing an offer for 20,000 over and they think, oh my God, we're paying 20,000 more than it's worth. They don't feel good about it. They're stressed about it. And they also figure like, how could we not get the offer accepted? You've got to set them up for success and make sure they understand what's happening out there. What is the trend? What's the actual market value likely to be? And what is somebody going to be willing to pay? Because that's ultimately what it comes down to in competition. So making sure that you're setting those expectations is huge. So um, as far as agents pricing under market value, it's sort of a chicken and egg scenario, in my opinion. Um, it was a trend that started in a couple of different areas and was less extreme, um, you know, 15 or 20,000 under market value as a way to attract multiple offers. Let those offers duke it out and push up the price, right? Then you ultimately get a little bit more than you were hoping for. Um, the downside of that is as time went on last year, what I noticed was it started to spread to other areas and it's pretty prominent now nearly everywhere with the exception of condos um, and maybe a little bit in luxury market depending on where you are. But what I noticed and the best story I can tell with this is I, um, I had a listing and it, I told the seller what it would sell for. I said, this will sell for about 150,000. This was last year. Um, I think we should price it around 139, 140, somewhere around there because we want to leave a little room because the buyers out there who've been there for a while are already used to making the effort to, um, I'm sorry, Tom's locked out and I'm distracted. Megan, can you let him in please? Um, so I told him 150 is the likely sale price. I told them we should list it for about 130 something. They said, no, we want to list it for what it should sell for. So they listed it for 150. We had it on the market for three days. We had 55 showings. And at the end of the day, no one wrote an offer. So that is a good example of what is happening in the market. They saw 150, they added 15, 20,000 to that number. And in their minds, that didn't make sense. It didn't match up with the um, comps in the area. It didn't match up with what was happening with recently listed homes and sales. It didn't match up. So after 55 showings, no one wrote an offer. So we dropped the price after three days from 150 to 139.9. Within two days, we had three offers and two of them were for more than 150. This is what's happening. This is what's happening. So it sounds crazy and it makes people feel like they are overpaying. That a little bit I am seeing happening, I would agree, but it's not to a grand extent. 
um, what I see happening is homes being priced under market value. So you really need to set expectations with your buyers. When you see a home, if their budget is 150, don't send them MLS listings at 150. They won't be able to compete. You're just setting them up to fail. So keep that in mind and don't just remember that for yourself, but explain yourself to them. So just so you know, this is what's happening. If you have room in your budget, if you know the perfect house comes along and it's one, you know, sale price 175, is that possible? If it is, I will send you $150,000 listings, but I don't want to set you up to fail. So setting those expectations when it comes to the buyer consultation, reminding people or updating them to what's going on in the market when you're on showings, maybe even having a check-in call or a Zoom to say, you know, I've noticed some changes in the market and I wanted to let you know. Um, this morning, Charlie mentioned that the new homes coming to market for the first time in a while is slightly outpacing the homes under contract. That's something worth celebrating. It's not major, but it's a little something and it's a little bit of hope for the people who have been missing out and not being able to get an accepted offer and looking for a while. So that's a bit of good news. It's worth sharing with your clients. Be the expert, be the go-to person for what's happening in the market. Don't leave them to be desperately digging around on Zillow and other sites to figure out what's going on and why you can't get them a house because they're going to blame you first. You're the easiest scapegoat in this scenario. And you want to be the person that is running the show, comforting them, giving them helpful information about what's happening and setting them up for success. So if you're noticing some changes, let them know. You have helpful information that's going to set them up for success. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't just assume that they think you know what you're doing and then that's that, right? Because they are floundering right now. It's too long. People are out there like desperately digging around thinking that, well, if my agent can't find something, I'm gonna put something on Facebook and ask my friends if they have something for sale. Like people are just spinning right now. So make sure that you're running the show, you're setting up their expectations and that you're, you're giving them updates as to what's happening. Now, once you've set expectations and continue to do so, Another important thing is as they're sending you listings and you're sending them listings, don't forget what their needs, wants, and wishes are. Make sure you have those top of mind somewhere. Um, when I have a buyer consultation, I fill out a page of notes. Before I have a buyer consultation, I ask people to fill out a chart that I made that has needs, wants, and wishes for location, size, and condition and features. Needs, wants, and wishes, location, size, conditions, and features. Because it is important that if, especially if it's two people, that they're on the same page about what they want and need. Um, it's, they are gonna have to be pretty psyched about a house in order to write a very strong offer. So it's important that they're on the same page and that you know exactly what is important to them. You don't wanna be walking through a house and then find out that they absolutely have to have a fireplace and you never knew this. You don't wanna be walking through a house and they like cut their workday short and drove through rush hour traffic and you squeeze them in for a 15 minute showing when you had something else going on and you get there and there's no backyard and they're like, oh, we don't even wanna see it. That's a deal breaker, not cool. So be aware of what's important to them and check back on that because it's going to change. It's going to have to change if their budget can't change. It's going to have to change if their location can't change. There's going to be give and take. Um, it's good to remind people that if a home is 85% or better of what they are looking for, it's worth an offer. 100% does not exist. It's a moving target. It changes too often. What they think they must have now might change later. So 85% or better is what they're going for. Make sure they're aware of that. And as you're looking through homes online or new listings coming up, remember that list, go back to that list. Um, another thing that I used to do and I'm going back to, so I've got my little post-it wall here with my clients. <laughs> um, that's my physical copy. I also have a digital copy. Um, I'm going back to using Trello, which is essentially, it's T-R-E-L-L-O. It's essentially a list app. Um, and it's basically like digital post-its. So I'm going back to that and I'm keeping my clients' names, their price point, if they have a pre-approval with whom, for how much, and what they're looking for. 
so that I can, and they're when they want to move by date, when their lease ends date. So you kind of know, are we getting close to that renewal? Um, so I can quickly grab that information as I'm going through the hot sheet each day. Um, and as I'm sending them things and I warn them too, I'm going to send you some houses that might not be a perfect fit. I'm going to push the boundaries of what you're looking for, because you may find something that um, really appeals to you. That's not exactly what you thought you wanted at the beginning. And that's okay. There's a terrible old saying that buyers are liars amongst agents. I think that's just due to agents who aren't asking questions, agents who aren't paying attention to what people really like and don't like and where people are willing to give. So buyers aren't liars. Buyers don't understand the market. Buyers don't know what they want because they've never bought a house before potentially, right? Like there is so much to know that they don't when they start that their ideal of what they want could change and that's okay, they're allowed to but you're there to pay attention to that, to learn what they're really, really is what most important to them and to be creative in this market. So I warn people ahead, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna send you some listings that are probably not gonna be perfect, but they may be worth considering um, if they are pretty close to what you're seeking. So hear me out, take a look at it and let me know, you won't hurt my feelings if it's not a good fit. So. You've got that in mind as you're sending them listings. When they send you listings, before you follow the instinct to just jump, oh my God, let's go right now. Can you go in three hours? Let's go right now. Can we go, we, there's a 15 minute and we can maybe squeeze it in and well, we could squeeze it and I can move this around and I could like not eat for 10 hours, but then I could do this and that, that should be fine. Let's just go, let's just go. Make sure you take the time to read the listing. Look at the private notes. Do they already have offers in hand? When are they reviewing them? Do they have a certain closing date that's not gonna work for your buyer? Is there a tenant living there and they're gonna be there for five months? That's not gonna work for your buyer. If they have a loan, they're gonna have to live in the property within 60 days after you close. So keep all of that stuff in mind. Pay attention to all of the information in MLS. They can't necessarily see the documents. Look at those. Is there something in there that says there's $16,000 worth of basement work that needs to be done? Can they afford to take that on? Is their lender even gonna allow it if the basement looks crazy? Set up their expectations. Make sure they know this stuff before you're standing in the house. Everyone's made major accommodations to get to this showing. You show up and it's no way gonna work and you could have avoided that by reading the listing. Don't feel bad about it. You can, again, set the expectations ahead of time. Send me listings of anything you love. Your job is to look for what grabs you. Your job is to look for what hits you in the heart buyer. That's your job. My job is to be the practical person. I'm gonna look at your needs and wants list. I'm gonna look at what the market's likely to do with the price on this home and who's gonna be offering what. And I'm gonna bring back, you know, devil's advocate. I'm gonna bring back the details to you that are worth considering before we schedule a showing. Hey, I noticed this does not have a backyard. How important is that if you get to be in this prime location? Oh, well, you know what? Yard's really a must have. We won't look at it. Or, you know what? If we could be in this location, we would totally give up a yard because there's a park down the street. Great, then you know ahead of time. Um, hey, looks like the reason this is such a bargain is there's a major problem in the basement. It needs $16,000 worth of work. The seller's not willing to do it. Is that something you're okay with taking on if you really like the house? Okay, cool. Let me send you the documents in advance. They look a little scary. We can talk more about what this means. So just be proactive with those listings they're sending you. Um, it's so often that they just get all jazzed about whatever they can get their hands on because there's such limited inventory. And then you get there and you're like, oh crap, there's no way this is gonna be a good fit for them. And all you did was say like, what's the address? Okay, we can get in at this time. Great, I'll see you there. And you didn't do any of your due diligence to figure out if it was a good match, if there was something that was a major deal breaker, if they're reviewing offers today at two and you scheduled your showing for 1.30, there's no chance of getting an offer in. So pay attention to those details. Also, when you do that, you're going to make things easier for the listing agent. And that's really important too. You want to come off as somebody who's easy to work with, who pays attention to details, who is considerate and thoughtful and smart. That's who they want to work with. 
You don't want to put the sellers out and you don't want to bother the listing agent with questions that are answered in the listing. So really paying attention to those listing details is huge. Um, I cannot stress that enough. I have, I'm not always perfect at this. There's that crazy time frame of like new listing and then all the lists, the showings fill up right away. So you got to move fast and you can't always do it. You know, worst case scenario, maybe set up the showing if you have to, they have one window and then look more thoroughly at what's in there. Um, but just be aware that it, you are the gatekeeper. So if they send you homes and they're not really a good match at all, mention that to them. What do you think of this? Is this worth the trade-off? Not in a judgy way, not in a, hey, this isn't what you're looking for, but you know, just wanted to point out a couple of things that may be worth considering. Okay, what do you think of that? This also opens up the conversation to finding out if there's something your buyers have decided they're willing to give on. Um, maybe you find out that a fan, you know, parents are gonna give them a bigger down payment so now they can afford more. Instead of just saying like, that's out of your budget, say, oh, has anything changed that has changed your budget? You know, maybe we can open up your listing search a little bit more than we could before. So having those continual conversations about their evolution in their search is super important because it's going to change, especially in this market, the inventory is not changing dramatically. So buyers are having to adjust to what's out there, whether it's to become more aggressive with their offers or to adjust what they're willing to purchase or what they're looking for. Um, it is a continuous conversation and we're working with buyers a lot longer, at least I am, than I used to. I could have someone with an accepted offer within a month maximum and we'd be closing you know, within 30 to 45 days. Well, now I have people I've been working with since January and they still don't have an accepted offer and some longer than that. And that's just a result of the market. But their search has evolved as we've gone along and that's because we're checking in and having those conversations. So um, they know they can send me something and be like, this looks great, but why is it still available? Or we know we said we wanted in this area, but check out this area. So they kind of, um, evolve with you. They kind of adjust to how you approach it and become more informed and smarter about their approach too. And that makes everything run smoother. So it's really, really worth taking the time, paying attention to the details and asking those questions. So Amanda, your schedule I, is showing. Yeah. I, I had a question. So um, you said that their job is to find homes they like and then send them to you. Do you ever get ahead of them and look at the hot sheet and go, oh, this home would be perfect for so-and-so. I'll book the time and then try to get the person in to see it or that never happens. I don't bother with that. Honestly, I don't have time to schedule appointments that may or may not pan out. Mm -hmm. If there's a house that I think they'll like, my ultimate goal is to find it before they do. But there are honestly times when I can't. I, I have too much going on and I, I have to be honest about that. So if you have the time, be that person be searching the hot sheet multiple times a day and sending them anything you think would work um, and warn them you're going to do it. Um, you know, if they don't want you texting them six houses at 10 AM, then don't find out what's best for them. But um, yeah, ideally you can find the house before they do and send it to them, find out how they feel about it. And then if they like it, schedule the appointment. There's no sense in scheduling an appointment when you don't even know if they can go or want to see it. There's too many people trying desperately to get into houses. I wouldn't block it for too long. Um, you're going to end up running around doing work that's unnecessary. So you got to kind of be proactive, but not not that proactive, maybe. <laughs> well, right. And if yeah. you don't if you don't block it, then they'll understand how fast they fill up. So that's probably a good they lesson. Catch on quickly. Yeah. yeah. Well, and again, this is an expectation you can set. Hey, mm -hmm. just so you know, in my buyer consultation, just so you know, when we're setting up showings, here's how it works. I'm going to send you a house or you're going to send me a house. It's a team effort to search for homes. When you send me a home, I'm going to point out some things that may or may not work for you. It's okay if you miss these details. That's what I'm here for. I'm looking out for your best interest based on what's important to you. If it seems like something you'd like to see, let's figure out a time that you can see it within the next 48 hours, ideally. Usually showings are about a half hour long these days. Sometimes as short as 15 minutes, which sounds nuts, but that's what's happening. The reason for it is that with COVID, 
people are requesting or requiring that we don't overlap showings. Back in the day, you could have an hour long window, you could show up somewhere in between, there might be other parties there. That is not what's happening now. So if you have friends who would look for homes two years ago, this is a different story. We have about a half hour to get in and out. We wanna be really efficient about what we're looking for, what we're looking at. And we have to be considerate of the fact that there's gonna be somebody right before us and right after us. And none of us really have as much time as we'd like to. So plan for that. Please show up on time. Be ready to take off your shoes. Be ready to use hand sanitizer, wear a mask, all the safety precautions of COVID. And when we're there, here's what's going to happen. And when I schedule my first showing with someone, the first time we're going out, I try very hard to either make that an hour long window, if it's one of the ones that actually allows it, or 45 minutes, or I just ask them to come early. 15 minutes early, I'll say our showing is going to start at four, but could we meet at 345? I want to go over a few things before we go on your first showing. They totally appreciate it. They're happy to do it. We adjust our times as needed. Then we stand outside the house in front and I let them know before we go, I'm going to meet you out front, you know, of the house. Please don't go on the property until I'm there. Um, I learned the hard way early. There was a house where an agent had left a key in the door with the door open and my clients just like wandered in without me. So tell them I'll meet you outside. Don't go in the house or on the property until I get there. I want to go over a few things before we start. I remind them, here's your job today. Your job is to picture yourself living here. Really, truly figure out how you're going to use the space, how the traffic flow is going to work for you. If hosting people is a really big deal, how is that going to work? Um, when it comes to the space you need for your daily living, you know, your office space, is this going to work? Your, um, you know, your bedroom, if you insist on having a king size bed, is it going to fit? Um, those sorts of things. Is natural light important? Let's pay attention to that too. So your job is to look at those important things to you and let's keep in mind what you cannot change and how important those things are, whether they work or don't, what you can change and if that's something you're willing to change. And if the stuff we can't change is a deal breaker, that is something to really think about. So you're gonna look around, picture yourself living there, see the things you like and don't like. Keep in mind the seller's stuff the color of the paint. These are things that either won't exist once closing happens or as a minimal change. Don't get caught up in goofy details like that. Really look at the space for what it is. My job is to be your advocate. If you have buyer agency with somebody and you better have signed buyer agency to do this, I am going to be your eyes of experience on this house. So we're gonna walk around the inside and I'm gonna be looking right, for I'll your reaction back. to things. Well, so please do fun. share how you feel about it. And I'm also going to be looking for any items of concern. So if you said that a, a great kitchen with counter space is super important to you, and that darn wide angle lens in the listing really made it look like there was a ton of counter space, and we get in there and there's like three feet of counter space, I'm going to point that out. Hey, is this going to work for you? Can we maybe put an island here? Is there another place you could add cabinetry with countertops? I'm also gonna point out things that could be a problem. Hey, I noticed these windows are all pretty old. I tried opening one, it didn't stay open. This may be something to budget for. It doesn't seem like they're leaking air right now, but it may be something to keep in mind. Just wanted to point that out. Um, when you're in the basement, unless it's a finished basement, people don't see the need to spend a lot of time down there, but there's tons of important stuff. If you've been on home inspections, you know this. You're not a home inspector. You can't say for sure if something's a problem or not, but you can point it out as a potential item of concern. Hey, I noticed there's a horizontal crack in this foundation wall. Um, you know, I can't say for sure if that's old or if it's current movement. It may come up in your home inspection. It's just something to consider. Hey, I noticed that they've got cardboard boxes on the ground and they're all stained with water that probably means that there was some kind of water seepage. It might not be the end of the world. It's a pretty easy fix if it's just a matter of grading or cleaning your gutters out, but I just want you to be aware. Hey, I noticed that this basement's totally finished, but the bottom of this drywall is all buckled out. That might be a sign there's been a water issue. We can maybe find out more about that. So that's your job. 
you're looking for the stuff that may be of concern to them or the things they cannot change that are going to be a problem. And you can point them out in a way that you're posing a question. You can point them out in a non-judgmental way. Instead of being like, oh geez, they are this place. Ugh. You can say like something to consider is that this may not be your jam in terms of how it looks right now, but could like a good scrub just bring this place back to life? Probably. Um, as a side note, when you're in homes, has anybody ever been in a house where there's a camera <laughs> or a speaker? Yeah, beware. <laughs> Make sure you set expectations for your clients as well. There is the possibility that we are being watched and listened to. So whatever we're saying, we have to pose it as if we are right in front of the sellers. So good thing to remind them of, good thing for you to remember. Um, you can say things in a way that are not going to upset a seller. And gosh, if you're gonna be writing an offer, you better not be on their bad list. There's no chance in heck they're gonna take that offer if they're that upset with you. So just keep that in mind too. Again, setting expectations for your clients. So when you're moving through a house, you also are going to have to watch the time. So it's, it's a real art to be able to do this to where it doesn't feel like you're pushing, where it doesn't feel like you're a pushy salesperson, and where it doesn't feel like you're dragging them along, but it is going to take a little while for them to get used to that time frame. Has anybody had that happen where they have slower moving clients and they're like, what do I even do? You're like, you've gotten through two rooms and you're 15 minutes in and you know you only have 15 more minutes and someone's already waiting outside. So it's a real art to pay attention to their body language, the clock, the things they're saying, and then how you're coming off. You really have to be careful not to be too agitated because it's going to make the whole situation very frantic feeling. And it's already stressful. It's not going to help your clients. So, you know, reminding them as you go along, oh, looks like we have about 15 minutes. We're about halfway through right now. Just want to let you know, just a little reminder. Um, hey, you know, we should, we should go take a look at the basement before we run out of time. Or I know the kitchen's super important to you. We haven't gotten there yet. Why don't we head that way so you have enough time to look at that space? You know, be their advocate in that situation, but also keep things moving along. You don't want to hold up the next showing. You don't want to be that person that's, you know, everybody's waiting for you to get out of there and you're 10, 15 minutes past your time. It's, it's tricky in this current situation where we can't overlap and these showing times are so short. So it's important to have a watch. It's important to keep an eye on things and kind of be the guide, keep things moving along without being too pushy. Um, another thing that I've come across and have heard um, people complain about before is when you are too enthusiastic, too rose-colored glasses about a home, it can come off as pushy. If a buyer walks into a house and they, you can see on their face that they are not impressed by this flipper's finishing abilities, that they don't find this to be the most amazing house they've ever seen. And you're going, oh, wow, look at this. This is so cool. Oh, did you see this? You could put this here. Like, does that, would you respond to that in a positive way? Like you walk into a store and you kind of pick up a sweater like this and the salesperson comes over and they're like, isn't it great? It's so wonderful. It's full price. You're going to love it. No, like pay attention to how people are reacting to the house and then pay attention to how you're delivering the information. You can say things about a house that are positive. You can try to keep things a little more light and not so stressful and heavy without coming off as a pushy salesperson. And it might not be that that's your intention, but it can come off that way if you're not really reading your audience. Reading your audience is so so important, especially right now, because people are so stressed out because you're spending so much more time with them. You're in so many more houses. You really are there as their advocate, not as the salesperson. So yes, point out positive things about the house, but also pay attention to how they're responding. And as you go along, you can tell them like, you're going to know if you love a house or not, as soon as you walk in. So if we get into a house and you're like, I've seen 10 houses, this is not it. Then, you know, let's take a quick walk through and keep moving. Or, you know what, 
I can already tell this is not going to work for you. We thought the yard was bigger. Everything in the listing pointed in that direction. We got here. It's just not going to work. Is this a deal breaker? Yes. Okay. Let's all save some time and not keep moving. Why don't we take this time to chat more about the other ones we're going to look at today? Why don't we chat more about whether we even want to consider this location? Whatever it is, be their advocate. Don't just be the person that takes their order, takes them to the door, unlocks, and just lets them go wild. Like be there by their side, walking them through, pointing out things to consider, good and bad, potential things they could do to add equity that wouldn't be that hard. What can you change? What can't you change? Reminding them of what's on the list, checking in to see if things have changed, paying attention to things that would be of major concern. Don't point out every problem if you know it's not that big of a deal to fix, but be aware of the defects. That is something we have to disclose, but pay attention to how you're delivering that. Just pointing out every problem in the house is also not helpful. So it's all about your delivery. It's all about being thoughtful in how you're pointing out things and, and the way that your audience, your buyer is responding to that. If you notice that you start pointing all this stuff out and they clearly look overwhelmed, maybe cool off on explaining what drain tile is. Just like take a step back. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the layout. Is this something you're gonna like? Is so much really helpful, informative conversation can happen while you're in a home and they're distracted enough that they're more likely to be more open to sharing with you. It's like when you sit in a car with somebody and you get way more out of them sitting in a car than you do staring them face to face. Have you had this happen to you? I do this with my husband on our way up north. I call him car talks. I get the most information from him when we're driving because he's not staring at me face to face. Same thing happens when I'm on showings with clients. They're looking around at the kitchen. I'm asking them like, would you be open to, you know, not having a formal dining room? How big of a deal is that? And they're just kind of blah, blah, blah while they're looking around and I'm getting all kinds of helpful info so I can better help them. So it's really quality time. It's definitely not the time to just stand back and say nothing. And it's not the time to be distracted on your phone. It's the time to be paying attention to how they're responding. It's the time to pipe in with a few bits of info here and there so they know you're there advocating for them, that you're paying attention to how they're responding to things. This is so important because when you go to write that offer, that offer that's 40,000 over asking, that offer that has all kinds of weird, creative contingency things happening in it to make it as appealing as you possibly can, you better feel really confident that this is a good fit for them and they should too. So you've got to set them up for success in that showing. You don't want them to write an offer that's just bananas off the wall. They get it accepted and then they immediately regret it. So getting them to the point where they feel in control, where they feel comfortable, where they feel like they're making an informed decision is super important. So the showing is really not a throwaway part of your job. This is something you should be doing very consciously, awake, connected, paying attention to them, paying attention to how you're delivering information. I actually I think have something to add ahead. to that. <laughs> um, so this last weekend, I was at a house with um, a client that it was really just not great, <laughs> uh, not very put together, you know. And um, it was clear that they were pretty upset, but it was in their price range and they, you know, so they were kind of uh, annoyed walking around the house and um, it ended up being really helpful just saying to them, like, what is it? I, I understand that you're not interested in this. What is it out of this house that you do like, though? Mm -hmm. And just asking that as an open ended kind of thing um, so that they can come back with like, well, you know, I mean, I guess I did like this thing if it were cleaner or if it were whatever and so mm -hmm. that ended up being really helpful uh for me too yeah <laughs> awesome yeah I mean it's kind of like a scavenger hunt right like you're trying to figure out what they want and you have a pretty good idea but it, it there's some curveballs in there right yes. so yeah <laughs> instead of just saying this is a complete throwaway useless yeah. amount of our time um something I often tell people is 
showings are always worthwhile if we do our due diligence before we go. And once we're there, if it's not a good fit, this is a process of elimination. You're not supposed to love every house you look at. You're supposed to be able to figure out what's a good fit. So if this one doesn't work, that's okay. We've accomplished something by figuring out what's not going to fit. So that's a really good point, Natalie. Yeah. If they're not loving it, why? Let's find out more. Um, and something simple you can do that sometimes I have to remind myself because one could assume that you're doing it is once I find out what's important or what they didn't like about the house, after, before we've completed the showing, like as we're in the driveway or on our way out to our cars, I can say, okay, so, so this place has exactly the land you're looking for and the extra garage is awesome. But the actual footprint, the square footage of the house is a little bit too small. Like if it was maybe 10 more feet in the living area and the basement, that would be a good fit. Yes, Amanda, exactly. Then they know you're paying attention. They know you get what they're looking for. They can relax a little bit that they're in good hands. And, and you have a clear picture moving forward. Instead of just assuming, you get clarification before you leave that showing. And that's important too. So yeah, Natalie, not just saying, well, they definitely didn't like that one. Instead of assuming what it's, what the reason is, get clarification. That's okay. Like you're, you're a team, you're trying to find this together. Um, so they're not, they're not your enemy. They're not trying to make your life hard. Um, and you're not trying to make their life hard. Like this is, this is a group activity. So it's good to just ask. Sometimes you just have to ask. People aren't necessarily just going to blab about their feelings on places. Some people will, and that's really helpful, but not everybody does. So that's a good point too. So following a showing, the other thing that is seems like an obvious thing to ask, but is to ask if it's a home worth writing an offer on. Do Does this house 85% or better match what your needs and wants are? If it does, it's worth considering an offer. You know, are you moved to make a very strong offer on this house? Not just an offer, but a very strong offer. Do you like this house enough that you would want to put it all out on the field for this house? They have to really think about that because going through the process of writing an offer can be emotional and exciting and draining and scary and time consuming. And if they're like, yeah, we'd write an offer, but we'd probably write like 5,000 over asking. Okay, well, let's talk about how that's gonna go, right? Set them up for success set their expectations, be their advocate. I'm not saying I'm not willing to take my time to write your offer, but here's the truth of the matter. We can do it as an exercise, but here's the trends in the market. If you're planning to write 5,000 over asking on this house, it is a very likely your offer will not be accepted based on what is going on right now. Are you okay with that happening? Is it worth your time to put an offer together that's likely to not get accepted? If you want to go through the process, you want to experience what it's like to put this together, that's worth the learning experience. Let's do it. But let's set the expectation that it's highly unlikely it's going to get accepted. Or more likely than not, they're going to say, oh, well, that's probably not worth it then. I don't think we want to write an offer. And you've saved everybody a whole bunch of drama, right? Including the listing agent and the seller. So it's hey, good to, question. yeah. Sorry. Um, I currently have a buyer that uh, his culture is very like they save a lot of money. They don't really spend a lot of money. They like they, if they if they want a counter offer, they'll do a thousand dollars, you know, mm -hmm. not five thousand or three thousand. So like um, I've been working with him for the last like month and a half, and um, he really wants to put offers below asking price. And I have set the expectations a million times. And I have, and every time we talk about a property that, like every time we go out, we see like four or five properties. And he's gone from condos to single family homes to duplex. Like he's all over the place, right? And, and in the beginning, I was like, okay, he's learning. You know, he doesn't know exactly what he's looking for. He's not from the US, you know, like there's a lot of things about it. Um, mm -hmm. And he, so he's a very, very smart guy. Um, like he's, going for his PhD, like everything has to be numbers, like he created his own uh, calculations for his mortgage, like it's insane, right? So, but he wants to offer below asking price. And he's like, just, just, just do it. Just write. And I'm like, you're not going to get it. Like you're mm -hmm. like, I mean, maybe, maybe it will happen. <laughs> With seven offers, 
enhanced? No, I don't think so. You know, and then I said, yeah. and I could tell him like, I not everybody is as smart as you are, and not everybody does like a comparable market analysis like you do and like we do together. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're just going by what the market is. If people are offering ten to twenty thousand over over asking, that's what they're gonna do, whether or not yeah. the house is worth it. You know. So how do you approach this? Like, how do you like? Do I just keep telling him, or do that's I? That's a good question. So Paula, I would say this: knowing your audience, this is a numbers guy, right? Like, he he does not operate on feelings. So if you say, "Here's what's happening in the market," this is what I know to be true, and you don't have on paper this house down the street listed for three twenty and they got an accepted offer at 365. This house sold in this neighborhood and this was the asking price and here's what it sold for 30,000 over asking. If he doesn't have true numbers to look at, he does not believe what you're telling him. He only thinks in numbers and detail. So he needs that evidence to know he can't go off of feelings or just your word. And it's not necessarily because he doesn't think you know what you're doing or trust you. It's just how his brain works. He needs to see it on paper. So knowing your audience is so important. And I think it would be helpful to pull some stats for him about what's happening in condos versus single families versus duplexes, because the over asking thing is very different with those. You know, right now, condos tend to be selling for quite close to asking price, depending on the area where you are. But having stats for that can really be helpful, I think, for somebody who needs that on paper numbers um, comparison. That's really only when he's going to see that. And then maybe he'll do some calculations based on that um, and have a better idea of what's going on. Um, you know, there are people where they really operate on feelings and, and reminding them, like, how badly do you want this house? Well, think about somebody who's been searching for six months and they, you know, they have kids and they're living in a tiny apartment and like, there's so much emotion behind it. They're willing to write these gigantic offers with everything stripped out of it just to get into a dang house. So that, that, that audience understands that approach. So you're going to have to kind of adjust what you highlight or how you share that information, depending on your audience. And when it's somebody who's that detailed and that intelligent about numbers and stats, you've got to speak their language to help them see the light. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I've been there and totally understand. <laughs> Like, just trust me. I know what I'm doing. Dang. <laughs> they don't, they don't get it until it's on paper. Yeah. It's one of the reasons when I do a listing presentation or a buyer consult, I kind of hit on information in a few different ways. I talk about emotion. I show some stats. I do some other stuff and I pay attention to who's grabbing that info and how they're taking it. Cause then I know who I'm dealing with. It's another reason to have a buyer consult early on. You'll know who are you dealing with? Did they bring a notebook with them? Did they fill out my little chart? Do they have a planner? Do they like that I sent a calendar invite? Like all that stuff is me figuring out who my audience is so that I can adjust my approach. And usually if it's two people, they're both different. So just knowing how to catch both people. This is a skill I picked up in restaurants. You have to read the room, know your audience. Um, and from teaching, I have learned how to approach different learning styles. So you can do that too. You don't have to have an ed degree to do that. Cool. That's a great example. Really great example. Comes up a lot. <laughs> awesome. Well, we've got a few minutes left. I think you've got some good information to, to consider, some good details. Hopefully you'll, you'll put into practice with talking to your clients in your buyer consult, setting their expectations along the way, talking them through this challenging market and, and walking them through showings. There is so much that can be done. There's so much value you can provide in those experiences to where they still feel loyal to you. They feel like you're doing all you can to help them in this market. They're not going to use them, use you as their scapegoat for their frustrations at the market. It's really important that you're continuously reminding them that you're a team. So um, this is a great segue into Janine's class on Thursday to writing winning offers. If you're asking these questions, pointing these things out, preparing people's expectations, it will be so much easier to walk them through writing a successful offer um, because you've already set the groundwork for that. 
Um, you've built that trust. You've set their expectations. You've helped them understand what's happening in the market. Um, so that's all really key. It's not just about writing the offer. It's not just about getting them to the showing ASAP. There's more to it than that. We do a lot more than that. The agents who are really successful in this business do more than open doors. Um, as an aside, when you're on showings, don't leave the key in the front door, please. If that was your house, would you be okay with that? Also, if another agent comes after you, don't just hand them the key. Do you know them? Are they really an agent? Do you know for sure? Put it back in the lockbox, lock the door, follow directions, turn the lights off. If there's video, if someone's paying attention, if the listing agent's the showing agent after you, they're gonna see if you did that stuff or not. And that could affect your client too. So don't forget that you are a professional, that this is someone's home, that you gotta pay attention to those little details too while you're serving your client to the highest ability you can. We all make mistakes, we're human, we're not perfect, but do your very best because all those things really do add up. Does anybody else have a challenging client or question before we wrap up for today? Maybe a highlight or something they're gonna take into the week of showings? I was thinking of a showing I did and the client was only interested in certain parts of the home and they weren't particularly interested in the basement. And I was doing it for another agent. So they weren't really my client. So I didn't pr couldn't prep them like that. But if you were to look at a home for the first time, what percent of the time would you devote to like the basement first and second floor if it if you were leading the the tour? On my first showing, I spend more time in the basement because there's a lot to learn down there. Once I've set their understanding or basic understanding of like, here's what I'm looking at. Is there a sump pump? What's the water main? Is it lead? Is there a gas meter inside? How's the furnace? Like I'm pointing out all these things on the first showing that are a bunch of things. Um, and then the next showings, I don't necessarily have to be as wordy about it. So then I'm like, yep, I'm going to be checking these things. Okay, cool, cool. And then they, generally speaking, they learn those things themselves. Then they're looking for the sump crack and they're looking at the furnace and they're faster about it. So, I mean, 10 minutes, maybe. Okay. It depends on how complicated it is. But um, ultimately, again, know your audience. If they're like obsessed with what's going on upstairs, get them downstairs to look around. And if they're like, yep, it's fine. Then like do a quick check of the stuff you need to check and then get back upstairs to where they are. You know, like you're, you still want to make sure that you check the things you can check. Cause you don't want to be writing an offer and have them be like, we want a radon test. And you're like, huh. Is there radon mitigation there? I can't remember. Like writing a radon test into an offer when they had radon mitigation in the house doesn't look great. <laughs> or, hey, do you recall, was there this or that? And you're like, oh, I don't know. Like you want to at least get eyeballs on it. <laughs> Anybody else? What are you, what are you going to use that you haven't been doing so far? Or something you maybe needed a refresher on when it comes to showings? I think for me, it's going to be trying to set that expectation. Um, one of the houses that we lost out on, and maybe Amanda, if you're available after this, just for like two, three minutes, I'd love to just kind of chat through it. But we lost mm -hmm. out on a house. It was a house in Mac one priced at 419. Um, they bought it two years ago for 359. All they did was new windows. Um, and even looking at the appreciation and cost of new windows, it was hard for another agent and myself to really see it over 400. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to write under asking. So we wrote it 405. Clients aren't desperate. They're just not looking to overpay for something that's a first purchase. So we were given the chance to up our offers a secondary. They just weren't interested. But I guess I'm wondering if I should shoot them a text and see if we can hop on a call because we lost out last night and just kind of, you know, re we talked last night afterwards, but kind of regroup and be like between our team meeting and my launch, we had really good discussions today. And I just kind of want to, you know, reaffirm those expectations because it sounds like if we're not writing at list price or even above list price, there's mm -hmm. no point. So I just kind of want to have that conversation with them and just wondering the, you know, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of buyers out there are really smart, right? So they're well-informed, you know, Paula's guy has charts and graphs and people are paying attention to what's going on out there. If they've been watching, you know, Zillow or whatever for the last year or two, 
the market has even changed in the last three months. So I think, you know, you can approach it from the perspective of I'm here to be your advocate. I know what's important to you. I see where you're coming from, but here's what we're up against as a team. What is happening in the market and what is motivating other buyers? And so it's important to keep perspective on your motivation and where you're willing to give to get what you want. So is it worth it to you to offer 420 when on a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, 5,000 additional dollars on a purchase price is about 25 bucks a month. So we're talking 75 to hundred dollars a month difference than what you're offering right now is 75 to hundred dollars a month worth it to you to get the house you love. Or is it not? Is price that important? Because if that's true, there's opportunities out there. There's always opportunities. I talked about it a couple of weeks ago. You can get creative. You can find the house that gets listed on a Monday and half the world misses it. You can find the house that was priced too high and nobody touched it. You can find the house with weird carpet that nobody wants to make a strong offer on. You can find those opportunities, but they're rare. They're going to take a lot longer to find. And if timeline is priority for you, maybe that's not the best way to go. If, you know, we're looking in a very specific location, we see what's come up in the last six months and it's not a whole lot, you know, are you willing to wait six more months to find what you're willing to look for? Like if you want to take this a little bit slower and you're only going to jump when the opportunity seems very specific, then, then that's how we'll approach it. But if you're like the timeline's important and we have to be in Mequon, and you know what, at the end of the day, 75 bucks a month is probably worth it. Put them in the driver's seat. I'm giving you the information. I'm empowering you to make the decision for yourself. And then it's up to you to decide how you want to approach it. And that's how I'll proceed. But just getting it very clear and on the same page about that approach. Because if they're like, dang, this isn't the market for us. That's fine. Should we check back in a month? I'll keep an eye on what's happening in the market. I'll keep sending you homes. If I notice the inventory has gone up quite a bit, maybe that's your time. Um, it doesn't have to be right now if that works for you. I'm here to do what works for you. I'm not trying to get you to close in two months so I get a paycheck. Not that that's what you're trying to do, Benji, but like, you know, just putting it out there so they can be like, oh, okay, yeah. cool. You're really looking out for me. Yeah, and that's kind of it is they're not really in any rush at all. They can kind of move when they're ready. So, and I've mm -hmm. explained that that there are people who have been looking for a year or two or they have a closing date on a home they're selling and they need to be in something new or they need to get into mm -hmm. a school district. Like there are people that are on strict timeframes and are willing to pay the extra 25,000 that mm -hmm. we're just not at this point. So I think yeah. that's where it was left, but good advice. Yeah, and know that even if they seem like a year out or so, that house could pop up that they're like, oh shoot, we went to the open house and we wrote an offer with the listing agent. So keep in touch with them. Um, continue to send them homes, continue to check back. Things could change. You never know. Um, it's all about that open communication, but you can also say like, okay, well, I'm going to keep sending homes that I think are really worth considering or are maybe a great opportunity, but I'm not going to do it every day. Um, I'm just going to be checking back. And if, if something changes for you, please let me know. Um, and if you haven't let me know, I'll probably, you know, I'll check back every couple of weeks and just see how things are going. So that they know you haven't forgotten about them, you're still looking out for them, but they also know you're not pushing them. Um, Cause yeah, you just never know. You think they're taking a break and then suddenly they found the house. We're at the open house right now. We just went to a house, open house or we just talked to a builder. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. All right, y'all. Well, hopefully this gave you some good food for thought. I hope you put these into practice. I think as agents in general, we could do a lot more for our clients when it comes to showings. I feel like that gets overlooked a lot. And especially right now, it's super important. So um, please keep this in mind as you go into showings for this week. And don't forget, um, we are all here to help to support you and help you to be successful as an agent. So Joan Reed is a great resource for going over offers and contracts. Our helpline is still available with Stephanie Minnick and Andy. Stillman to answer your quick questions. Texting them is best or leave a voicemail if you call, please. Um, and if you wanted to set up an accountability call with me, just to keep on top of your goals, your goal setting and your progress, um, I'm your gal. You can text me and we'll set up a time for that. Um, and I hope you all have a fabulous week. It should be warming up by the weekend and it'll really start to feel like spring soon. So 
Um, hope you're getting out there and being the best you can for your clients too. Thanks so much for participating. Nice to see your faces. Thank you, Amanda. You're welcome. Thank you.